All right. Well, good evening and welcome. And thank you for joining us for GIS After Dark. My name is Cassandra Hansen, and I'm the Program Director for GIS and Environmental Sciences and Policy at Johns Hopkins University Advanced Academic Program. This presentation is being recorded, and it will be available at our uh, JHU GIS YouTube channel once it's processed. And you will also be sent a recording of this video as well if you'd like to refer back to it. So for those of you who are not familiar with our GIS program, we're fully online and flexible Masters of Science and GIS certification program. And tonight you're gonna to be hearing from our talented GIS faculty and geospatial facilities director, Mark Washington and Jonathan Dandois. For those of you who are joining us for the first time tonight, this speaker series is designed to highlight the amazing work that industry GIS professionals, JHU students and alumni are doing in the field of GIS. And I'm just kind of curious to see who is in the audience. So what I would like to do is launch a poll. So the first one is going to be asking you um, who's joining us today. You have your choice between the general public, GIS professionals, students, faculty, and alumni. Excellent. So we have a little bit of a little bit of everyone joining us tonight. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. So a couple more seconds to get your responses in. It's nice to see a, a large student turnout tonight. So again, welcome. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and end that poll. So it looks like we have 18% general public. We have some GIS professionals here. Great. 59% uh, students. We have some faculty joining us and alumni. So again, wonderful distribution. Um, the second poll that I would like to launch is to hear a little bit about your familiarity um, with GIS. Is this, do you have no knowledge, some knowledge, currently learning about GIS? Um, or maybe it's been a while and you're coming on back to, to learning a little bit more. Again, let's hear a little bit about your background. Okay, excellent. So good, a good spread of folks that have no knowledge, some knowledge, they're currently learning and that have been using GIS for a while. Um, so that's great. So welcome, welcome. Um, before we get started to talking about GIS, I would like to hear and see where folks are joining us from. So if you could just go ahead in the chat window, um, place your geographic location, maybe give a hi or a, a little thumbs up or welcome. Uh, icon emoji to our presenters tonight. So go ahead and let us know where you're joining us from. And for those of you who have participated in Zooms before, we will be able to answer questions that you have during the presentations in the chat um, window, but you can also post questions in the Q&A. And I'm more than happy to uh, give voice to those Q&A questions at the very end, but we also, have, Jonathan and Mark will be able to answer questions live um, as you post them within uh, the chat window. And Jonathan, I love that you put the latitude and longitude in there. That's great. This, that's the perfect way to start uh, tonight's GIS After Dark. Well, so welcome everyone. It looks like we have a nice uh, geospatial distribution of folks joining us tonight. So for folks that are not familiar with GIS, let's just go ahead and just do a very simple overview. So the Geographic Information System, otherwise known as GIS, allows for the creation and collection of geospatial uh, information in simple maps or apps and representing what is known as the overall goal for any GIS professional through the use of data collection, analysis, map creation, and apps. And so we're always wanting to know more about the what, the when, the where, the why, and the hows of our geospatial world. And we have definitely seen the leverage and the, the powerful data visualization and analysis um, over the last couple of years as it um, pertains to the COVID dashboard. So we've seen that geospatial reach of this amazing technology that allows for us to monitor COVID cases, um, which has been a lot of, of fun to see over the years how it has changed over time. I would also like to highlight the usefulness of GIS um, after natural disasters. So the, bottom, the image that we see in the bottom right here is work that Hopkins students and alumni um, have put together through OpenStreetMap humanitarian efforts in digitizing buildings in Turkey and Syria after that devastating earthquake. So again, we are continually uh, working on projects through OpenStreetMap. So if you're interested in participating or volunteering, please reach out to me and I'm more than happy to bring you on um, and make you a, a part of the, the geospatial community in this, in this effort. Okay, so a little bit of background about GIS and how it's used. So let's get on with the, the main show tonight. 
I am so pleased to welcome Mark Washington and Jonathan Dandois um, here. Mark is the Director of Information Systems for Johns Hopkins 555 Penn ITAV Department in Washington, D.C. And he's also the architect of the Johns Hopkins Geographic Information Systems for the Infrastructure and Utility, uh, utility Management, supporting all university geospatial infrastructure pro projects. So he's a very busy guy. He's also an adjunct instructor for the AAP program, and he is currently teaching GIS for infrastructure management. So if you are in his class right now, you're getting extra credit points, I think, right, Mark? I'd also like to welcome Jonathan Dandois. Uh, he is a GIS manager for Johns Hopkins Facilities and Real Estate. The acronym is JHFRE, uh, where he manages Esri Enterprise Geosystems to track all exterior and some interior assets of Johns Hopkins business in Baltimore and the surrounding area. And I will say, I'm so happy that you both are joining us tonight. So. Let's everyone who's here, let's just give them a virtual round of applause. Thank you both for being here tonight. I'm so excited to hear about what you've been working on. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn over the sharing capabilities to, to Jonathan. So welcome, welcome Jonathan and Mark. Thank you, Cassandra. All right, let's get this going here. All right, uh, Mark, do you want to start us off, please? Sure, sure. Well, thank you, everyone, for giving us the time tonight to talk about our systems with uh, facilities in real estate. And I uh, want to thank my co-presenter, Jonathan Dandois, and all the hard work he's doing as GIS manager at facilities in real estate. We'll get to the next one. Okay. And there's other team members that are actually at facilities in real estate that I just want to give a shout out to. Uh, that is Caitlin Wolf, who's our GIS analyst, and she's a document management specialist. And uh, last but not least is Destiny Rivas, who is our senior space systems administrator, doing great work for us. The team has done a phenomenal job developing and enhancing this integrated system you're going to see today. So myself, I've been with uh, Johns Hopkins since uh, tw late 2016. And when I came into the... Um, into Johns Hopkins, I realized we didn't have a GIS system. So that was one of the first things I requested. Uh, since uh, November of 2022, I've moved on to a new role. I'm the incoming IT director for the new facility uh, at 555 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, DC. So I led this team that I mentioned for six years and I witnessed uh, exponential growth of a system that just did not exist when I joined in October 2016. And I immediately requested funds from my vice president at the time to create and launch a JS enterprise because I just thought it would tie everything together that we have. So it would integrate uh, the systems, multiple systems to show all of the land and building assets in the state of Maryland and uh, globally. So here we started with a blank slate uh, back in, in 2017 just a few months after I was hired, uh, I needed some help. So I, I reached out and uh, I hired a local firm, JMT. They're a Maryland-based engineering firm. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Nikki Miller. I think she's on the call. Nikki and her team, uh, they specialize in GIS and they assisted us with developing and executing a strategic plan for the implementation that included uh, discussions with stakeholders that was really important across the university building out the virtual server and database uh, IT infrastructure uh, that JHU could own and operate going forward, which we did. Uh, next, uh, one of the fundamental pillars uh, of our GIS system was the creation of data governance. Um, and this is what I talked to my students about in, in my class. Uh, these are rules that we drafted and circulated throughout the university so we can receive buy-in as well as their participation in the system. Uh, this is kind of the background mundane stuff that needs to happen for the system to function. So the JHU campus map, uh, we need uh, for it to be supported by uh, a geo database. It's gonna have sensitive as well as confidential uh, data on JHU's buildings, lands, and utilities. So that's why we needed governance. And we need to clearly define our roles as data stewards 
and defer to owners whenever there were requests for system access or data distribution. So we don't just give data out whenever anyone asks for it. We make sure we check back in with the data owners to say, is this okay? Are you comfortable with that? And that's how we maintain this trust that we've built. We also made documentation of the system a high priority so that we can maintain it and expand it, its capabilities over time. Real quick, security is paramount for every web-based application and we didn't cut corners here. So we partnered with JHU's uh, central IT department uh, to implement a system that exceeded their requirements. Uh, the Esri Geo database allowed us to control access to our data down to the field level in each table, as we show here. Uh, this level of security convinced our stakeholders that our data would be safe and only viewed by the intended individuals or groups. This, I, I can't overstress the importance of having good application security. All right. So uh, IT integrations, uh, a primary reason for developing our GIS campus map was to integrate the enterprise data stored in multiple applications within facilities, real estate, within facilities and real estate and across the university. My vision at the time was to create a campus map that could quickly render summary data with links to details buried in other enterprise applications, including space management, work order and asset management. Uh, I'm going to shout out here to our former colleague, Amanda Klein, who just moved on recently, but she did a phenomenal job with that system called Maximo and document management. So all those systems kind of come together in this first edition of our campus map where you can pull data from all those different uh, systems and, and have it kind of at your fingertips. So next, fast forwarding to March, 2023, uh, we have a maturing enterprise GIS with apps well beyond our integrated campus map that we built uh, back in 2018. Uh, they're helping our colleagues at JHU to complete their work in an efficient and productive way. You know, it really helps to know uh, where things are located when you need to do field work. And, and this system does a great job with that. Not to mention the historical data and real-time updates uh, that are available in some cases. So with that quick overview, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Jonathan Dandois, to kind of go into the weeds, as we say, <laughs> into the system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so I'm Jonathan Dandois. I've been in this role for about three and a half years, been doing GIS for a long time. Um, and I hope you guys don't think we gave Mark the boring slides. We gave Mark the foundational slides, right? Because like Mark said, there was no GIS when he got here. And what does that mean, right? If you're a GIS user, uh, or even if you're not, and you, you, you probably use GIS all the time, right? You want to know about your land or your property or, or your tax records or something, you could probably take advantage of a municipal city or county GIS website. And, there's a, and you're using the front end, you're using a map or an app of the GIS that somebody spent a lot of time curating to make it easy for you to use. But there's probably years of work that took place behind that to do the governance and data security and, and, and IT infrastructure that it takes to get to the point where it, oof, it's easy to make an app, right? And so I kind of came in in the tail end of all of this really hard infrastructure work and these conversations where people don't know what GIS is. Maybe they don't care, but they care a lot now, right? And my job is very busy. We go from when I started here, we were managing that one campus map and we, we just we couldn't keep the, the horses out of the barn, right? I know we, we tried to have caution and say, keep it slow, but it, it's getting too big. It's, it's moving fast now. And, and it's, it's just like any other GIS. If you go to a Esri conference or something else, it's about apps, right? We're creating a lot of different solutions and, and really showing mature use of the system to help locate things, to drive uh, information intelligence and innovation for facilities and real estate work. So I'm gonna showcase a number of those different app solutions. I think there's a lot of fun graphics and a lot of exciting work we're doing. A lot of this is done with help from our partners, from JMT and other vendors. So quick thought, shout out again to them. Thanks everybody. Uh, so let, let's dive in. Um, 
you know, Mark started with a handful of data sets and we're over a hundred different kinds of feature classes and tables in our enterprise data set now, ranging from uh, structures and art features to imagery, to security aspects, to underground utilities. Most of these things have at least one picture. They've been surveyed or resurveyed or visited within the last couple of years um, and often have a number of different attributes about its type its quality, its characteristics, or its condition, or if we could find it, right? <laughs> Sometimes if somebody says something there, eh, it's not there. But um, but we, we try to record all that. We've grown. Uh, if, if you guys are geographers, you know, like you could think of, um, you know, kind of like an inverse distance weight, right? We definitely have way more information density at the Homewood campus, close to where we work and where most of our activity happens. Information density declines as we get further away from Homewood, but we are trying to capture and have a touch point in this system for everywhere where the enterprise is doing work, right? So that's the university and the medicine, and um, whether it's a, a leased property by Bloomberg School of Public Health on the other side of the country, or new properties in Charles Village, right? We wanna make sure that the GIS has a location point for all this different information. Um, once we get to that basic thing, hey, we do work there, then it's a matter of, well, do we have more assets we need to put into the system, um, more utility information, uh, more imagery, and, 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 it, and it grows, <laughs> and there's a lot. Um, we've, we've had a good partnership with the uh, Sheridan Libraries, the GIS and Data ArcGIS Online organization. Uh, many of you are students, so you're probably even using some of this data. It's not everything. It's a small subset and mostly at the Homewood campus, but it is authoritative, right? It comes strictly from our business process. Uh, I update it about every year or so, um, but I think that's a really good resource uh, and, and we look forward to seeing what people create from that. So we'll, we'll keep putting that in there and, and keep letting me know and, and letting the folks at the data services group know if, if you have any questions about that. I just want to add real yes. quick to yeah. use that data in our in the class. Good. That, that Good. And it's Good. very useful. <clears throat> yeah, but I think I owe you guys some new imagery, maybe, but all the, the infrastructure is, yeah. is up to date as of um last month or so or December or so. Yeah. Very helpful. Got some new imagery coming. Yep. Um <clears throat> And yeah, apps, right? Uh, we have lots of apps. We're using an Esri ArcGIS enterprise environment for, for everything. And so, you know, if you if you go to an Esri conference, it's all about apps, right? You make feature layers, you make services, you make maps, you make apps. Um, I think we've got a lot of fun apps. Sometimes we feel like, hey, you know, can we just have everything in one map? And, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to that. But sometimes you really need a dedicated app for, for maybe one or two users, right? Maybe they really need something very specific to help them with their work. Um, the core of my, my job, I say, the thing I'm supposed to do most often, most of the day, is to keep this campus map up to date, right? This is our campus base map that has information like we've seen in previous slides for our main campuses. It doesn't have every feature layer in it, but it has a subset of some of the more important ones, but also ones to showcase. Um, we keep it up to date uh, with a, a pretty pretty good feed of yeah, aerial imagery from the company Nearmap. They fly over all metro areas a couple times a year, and we put that into our system here. So we have really high fidelity uh, map or imagery information that, that's way more current than Google or Microsoft or whatever. Uh, you can see, I probably come through on the imagery here a little bit, you know, the active construction happening on campus for the Student Center and the Agora. And our colleagues in facilities and real estate get a lot of value out of that really high quality, really current imagery um, to the point even where I'm talking about flying my drone out to get very current real time imagery. But we'll talk about that. I just want to add one yeah. thing, Jonathan, Yeah. Uh, about that map you just had up. So this map that Jonathan was just talking over, the Johns Hopkins campus map, is inward facing. It's really for our colleagues within facilities and real estate and for security and some other uh, internal departments. But we do provide data to the public facing maps that you see uh, that Johns Hopkins has on their on their website. Yeah. Um, if you've used an Esri ArcGIS map or any kind of web map, you know, you click things and stuff happens, information appears. And we 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 have a lot of information we drive through our buildings and other assets, whether it be linkages to different enterprise systems like our document management or building utilities or other infrastructure. Um, and we think, you know, people get a lot of value out of this, right? Because oftentimes these documents and these floor plans or other data 
are buried deep within another enterprise software that's maybe not as intuitive, requires more power use. Um, but most people these days can click on a map and click a link, download a PDF, and I think people really are comfortable with that. So we try to make that, it's information dense, but we try to make it you know easy to get to stuff. We've recently been moving indoors with our GIS, and I'll show way more of these slides in a little bit. Um, but we have a lot of floor plan information for all of our buildings that's needed for, you know, keeping the operation running. And we've been putting this into the GIS for a number of reasons, right, to, to look at space management across the whole campus in one view, but also to drive asset management. Uh, and it just creates some amazing maps, and, and we think it will create some amazing business value for, for our facilities and real estate work. Um, so that's fun. And, and we can do things with GIS that you just, you know, can't do really well with CAD, right? Oh, I want to symbolize something this way. Boop, no problem. Um, or go deeper and, and start to analyze that and say, well, who's using space where and, and how effectively is it being used? Um, you know, a simple graphic like this, right? Where is Krieger School located on Homewood campus versus predominantly where is the Whiting School versus where is student services? We, we were not able to create these graphics before we did this GIS integration work. And we've showed this to our peers in planning and architecture, and they're very excited about, about these kinds of capabilities. And I think we are doing some really mind-blowing stuff with this, right? SpongeBob agrees with me. We've recently started working a lot with the Esri platform to put a lot more very high fidelity indoor floor plan information into the GIS. So this is an animated GIF here of a very complicated GIS data that's driven from floor plans, showing a very high resolution and high accuracy and loading very fast, where we can flip between floors, we can show which schools or building services are in a space. Um, we, we, we're demoing this internally. We've had interns going out and using this to map building shutoffs, to map AEDs inside buildings. It's not just sticking a little dot on a building on a map. The AED is being placed exactly where it is in the building to the correct floor in a kind of floor aware sense. Um, and our, our colleagues in plant operations, those are the guys, the, the tradesmen and women that are fixing the buildings and making them work. They're very excited about this, right? Because they see a lot of turnover in staff and a lot of staff retiring and new people coming in. People don't know where stuff is, right? And it's hard to just sometimes say, here's a piece of paper, it's over there. But if we can put this on their iPad and link that to their work order management, which says, hey, I'm a carpenter, I have to do this work today. Oh, I can just route right there. I know exactly where that stuff is, right? We can, we're getting close to being able to provide that kind of service. I just want to add real quick, okay. Jonathan, that yeah. when, when this uh, was rolled out back in 2018, our, our GIS enterprise, uh, this was inconceivable. I, I did in not imagine we'd have. I did not imagine we'd have this level of integration at that time. And just the fact that we linked the systems together, it would just generate more ideas of how we could render additional information yeah. using the uh, GIS uh, map as a foundation. And, yeah. and you've done a phenomenal job with that. And, and and thank you. And it's not just it's not just web graphics like this. Uh, we have a, a workflow that's used to generate uh, PDF printouts of where the AEDs are at each floor. But because the AEDs are all in the GIS, AED, sorry, is automatic electronic defibrillator. It's something yes. you want to know where it is in case there's an emergency. Um, but, you know, somebody's not going to look at their phone for the web map, right, when, when there's an emergency. But we're, we can generate a stack of PDFs to say exactly where that AED is, and exactly that floor, kind of at the click of a button. Here you go. And those PDFs per floor can be given to building managers, can be posted uh, versus going into another product and placing the little pin and then moving it on. You know, the, the GIS isn't just about web technology. It's just sometimes we make a lot of PDFs maps, right? And, and people get a lot of value out of those. All right, we've seen enough of SpongeBob. Um, another very exciting integration is, is actually a combination of many systems. Um, and that is how we're, we're trying to do what we call document management. And that's a better way to link, to find, to index and search for our business documents in a digital way. Um, I can't go into every single system on this slide here. There's a tremendous amount of work and, 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 and staff power and years gone into this. 
But um, imagine we have blueprints for a building, right? When the building is built 100 years ago, in the case of almost Maryland Hall, right, it's quite old. And lots of renovations have happened since then. These sit in a plan room and they're in stacks. Uh, we're digitizing those, scanning them and linking them to the GIS. So if you click on Maryland Hall or even potentially click on a suite in Maryland Hall on a certain floor, you get a little pop up that says, hey, these drawings are all associated with that floor and that building. And they're from, you know, 1940, 1960, and they're related to asbestos removal or or new windows or whatever the case might be versus uh, we got to go find it in the plan room. <laughs> it's a stack of papers or uh, it, it's it's in a in a folder structure on your Windows Explorer and you're clicking and opening and clicking and opening. This is a lot better. Um, in a simple sense, we click on a building and we have a quick list of, of documents that come up, whether they're, you know, inspection reports about the health of this building or floor plans. Or we can drive down deeper and get another pop up and user interface experience that really helps us drill down to an individual a blueprint or drawing or sheet. In this case, we have some, and it's a little redacted, but I think it's like a section or something, right? And we can tell that it, it's like, this is exactly the drawing I need and click, 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 click. And it's searchable and it's indexable. And people are really starting to get a lot of, this is getting a lot of traction, right? People are seeing the value of this. And it's, uh, I don't know, we were at lunch today and talking about how one of our interns is leaving and he has been indexing and coding these words into a lot of these drawings. And he's like, oh, I'm almost done. It's, now, this work is never done, right? There's always more documents, there's always more indexing, but but I think that that shows how valuable it can be. Um, I had to blur this one out a lot, but it's a really fun data set and a number of data sets, but we've generated some apps to highlight all of our underground utility infrastructure at the Bayview campus and at, at Homewood campus. Uh, and we've, we've used some interactive tools. In this case, this product is called Geocortex or Vertigis. Um, to say, well, I only want to look at the chilled water underground utility systems or the steam or the electric, and let's filter the map to that quickly, because this map, I think, contains about 40 or so different feature layers from the database. Um, and okay, now I have points of, in this case, we've got some pictures here. Um, they're storm tunnel sewer pictures, <laughs> they're video camera pictures. But uh, this is a, a little rover that's gone inside the storm tunnels, or in some cases, an electric drone that's gone inside a, an unsafe manhole um, and taken pictures and surveyed and looked for cracks and deformities and, and other kinds of problems. And we can click on a feature on a point or a storm line and see this detail, right? And get to that information very quickly. Um, we, we, if there's an incident, you know, people that are at their computer trying to find information and they can generate a PDF from this very quickly and give that to a contractor or say, look, I think, you know, we, the, the problems in this area, right? Let's go work and, and try to get information out of that versus flipping through plans in a plan room or, or who knows what. Um, and this is, this is a very exciting, we call this our living data sets, right? Because they're never going to be current or, or up to date. They'll, they'll never be done. You know, stuff is always going in, stuff is always coming out. You're finding stuff that's been there a hundred years that we didn't know about. Uh, but these are really fun and they can kind of make these rainbow spaghetti maps. I just want to say this one, yeah. uh, this application has been transformative yeah. for the, uh, maintenance crew at Bayview that they had this at their fingertips. So you can bring this up easily on a mobile device. They're using uh, iPads yeah. and they're in the field and they can actually see where the problem area is. If there's a, a leak or there's an electrical outage, they know exactly where to go based on this app. And then uh, Jonathan has tied in all of the affiliated documents, uh, the, a lot of pictures and video clips showing these uh, uh, descent into some of these unsafe spaces. And so it's just been a game changer. And, and I think we did a small sample for them like two and a half years ago, and they just bought all in, into it. So now uh, they've invested quite a bit in maintaining this app and taking it to the next level. So, and we're trying to replicate this at Homewood. I think we're trying to now catch up to where Baby is. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's always fun to add more data to those maps. Yes. Um, this is an app that we're really excited about, but it's only for one user. It's a very important user. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very important app, um, but I think that shows the value of apps, right? And and our ability to make them. So this is a, a tree app we we help uh, we wrote with, with help from our partner JMT uh, for the head groundskeeper on the Homewood campus. He is not a technical or GIS user, but he really cares about these trees and he cares about the grounds. 
uh, as you know, it's a beautiful campus, uh, but he wants to help maintain the trees, right, and maintain them in a database sense. So we built this app for him. Uh, he can he can virtually plant trees in the GIS on his tablet or on his desktop on a rainy day, of course, because it's not raining. He's out on out in the field. Uh, he can re digitally remove trees that have been uh, taken out by um, construction or disease, but we're not actually deleting those records in a data sense. We're just changing their status. So if he needs to go back and report and say, well, I, you know, I took out, you know, uh, 20 trees from this construction project. I need to know that because I have to go plant, you know, a 200 more or whatever, right? Um, and we get kind of fits and spurts from him as he's able with the weather to go in and enter data. But it, it's been, I think, really rewarding. And, and he's really engaged with it. Uh, a very non-technical person doing something quite technical. It's It's been really cool. Um, and he wants more, right? It's quick get the utilities in here because I don't want to dig a hole and, you know, and hit a pipe or anything or an irrigation pipe. So whenever somebody asks for more stuff, you know you're, you're doing good. So uh, this one doesn't look like much, but it represents a huge amount of work and a huge potential here. Um, the the Coropleth map here at right with these pink and purple colors that are colorblind safe uh, represents a, a really dynamic database query between our work order management system that is being activated constantly. So if your students, faculty, your staff, and you're submitting reports that uh, the AC doesn't work, the light's broken, the water's leaking, those go into this asset management system and somebody's fixing them, right? Or who's replacing your filter constantly or making sure your water's clean and that sort of thing, that goes into this system. Uh, it's a very powerful system in and of itself, but we found our operations managers and directors, they kind of need a high level view as well. So we built this this dynamic tool that will load, it takes data from our GIS about where the buildings are. It goes and grabs data from this other asset management system and it dynamically chews them up and provides us this Coropleth map here, right? So we can see that uh, places like Levering Hall maybe only have 10 work orders or something like that, but Maryland Hall has a lot of work orders and a lot of work that's going on. And those managers would then be able to drill down um, into the building to, to drill into these individual PMs here, these results on the left, and say, well, whose job was that? Whose department is that? Is it carpentry? Is it roofing, et cetera? Is there a problem, a, a bigger issue? Is there a staffing issue? Is there a physical building problem that is not obvious from the reports that are being generated? And uh, we think this is just a, a really, really exciting graphical way to, um, to drive intelligence and work. Uh, and also, we print this map up here, and, and I brought up these colors for a very particular reason. Um, many of our directors are colorblind, and they have different colorblind deficiencies. And um, that's really a challenge when you're making maps, um, when you need to show lots of different kinds of stuff, right? Um, so, you know, those are really, really important things. Um, as you're, you're working on GIS and learning, you know, our, our, our director of operations, He's always looking at things that are good, bad, active, inactive, uh, uh, declining or increasing. And often those are presented as red and green. And he's like, we have to do different. We have need something else, right? Uh, and so we're, we, we all kind of are learning and growing in that to, to support that. Um, so sometimes the colors look a little weird, but you know, I think it still pops, right? And it still conveys a lot of value. I agree. I, if I could just chime in for one second, yeah, yeah, yeah. this particular this particular application that we're linking to, Maximo, is one of our, our our most interactive enterprise applications that we have in facilities and real estate. It gets hundreds and hundreds of hits every day for requests for maintenance out in the field at multiple campuses, primarily Homewood, but other campuses as well. And that system is already supported by mobile devices, and we get real time updates about people in the field as things are happening. And as they're being repaired, we get the information in real time. So we've just recently been able to make this connection with GIS. And this application is less than a year old. And this has just blew them away. They said, this is something we've wanted for years. So this is really the culmination of a lot of hard work in the background to bring this, this highly interactive uh, enterprise application to kind of map it and show them where the hotspots are around campus. And that's really another transformative Kind of result of our application of GIS. Yeah, no, it's great. 
That's great. There's a lot of work to get here. And it looks like a pretty simple map, but it's, it's yes. quite complicated. And it's still developing. I think yes. this is the tip of the iceberg. They were like, this is great. And they're, they're, now they're thinking, what other maps can we get? What else can we, oh, yes. else can we oh, yes. kind of carve they, up this uh, data and map it and see it and then make us yep. more efficient and save money? Yep. This is this version one, version two is on deck. Not in this, not in these slides. I'm sorry, but um, we they've wanted more filters, more graphical indications. So we've we've in, enriched this with icons, right? So we know which trade each one of these little records in the list here, what their uh, how critical they are, how old they are. So if a, if a ticket is over 90 days old, it gets a big angry red button. And, a badge and said, this is a problem, right? Because they're they're supposed to be cleared quickly. Uh, and and it's not to, you know, put anybody to task or get anybody in trouble. It's to try to make sure that our customers, who are many of you, are are you know okay. Yes, and to make fewer trips back yes, and forth from the <laughs> from uh, where the parts are stored. Yeah. Because our, our technicians don't live in these buildings. We are uh, they're in a building off site. They're at the Keswick campus. So they have to travel back and forth. So they know everything they need to do at the beginning of their, their day and they know where the hotspots are. They can prepare adequately and make fewer trips back and forth and save, uh, you know, on gas and, and time, which is very important. Yep. All right. Okay. Moving on. This is a Moving fun slide. Though. It's good. Um, Everything you've seen so far, except for the, the Sheridan Libraries work has been internal, right? It's for facilities and real estate use and some limited internal Hopkins users. But we do work outside the firewall, as we say. Um, and we worked with many partners, uh, including in student disability services and in design and construction and, and general counsel and transportation and others to this August prepare this PDF uh, map of accessible paths on the very old and, and complicated Homewood campus. Um, we think it's an information dense map. We think we're all very proud of this map and, and what it represents. Um, and, and we are continuing to work on this, right? So um, as you might imagine, seeing the slides that we have, there's a lot more we could do and, and we're all talking about the same thing. But this is pretty exciting for us. We don't have a lot of public maps out like this kind of thing yet, um, but you know, we're, we're, we're working on that. And, and at some point in the future, there could be an app that has this information. There could be. That's something that, that we're working towards in the future. Yeah. We don't have a, a launch date for that, but that is certainly something that I believe the university is interested in developing. Yep. Yep. And, um, you know, you can't make something like this without that foundation that Mark started seven years ago, right? To get to here, to get the things beyond this, you had to start at all that hard stuff, that stuff that seems boring, but it's actually very important. Um, this was a very interesting map to make, and it will make more future complicated maps um, because people need different things, right? And, and this was a PDF, and it's as good as it can be as a PDF, but we know that there's more information that we want to give to people to, to meet their needs. Um, and so it's step one. Um, totally different, but still on the campus, we, we engaged in a very complicated project to digitally laser scan about a mile of tunnel under the Homewood campus. If you didn't know they were there, I didn't tell you. Um, but this is a very valuable and important data set. So all these laser scans are combined together and you're seeing a few different graphics here of, uh, what that laser scan information contains. Um, and we we had a consultant do all the scanning to register all these scans. These little orange circles more or less indicate where the laser machine was inside the tunnels. Um, and um, and all of those scans were put together into one giant model. And then they were further modeled into a software called BIM, Building Information Modeling, to make this 3D representation of these tunnels. And that's what you see happening here in this video, where I was actually navigating a section of tunnel in VR. So each one of those pipes has been modeled. It's in its correct location in 3D space in the real world. They have attributes of what properties it has, if it's a steam tunnel or an electrical tunnel, or excuse me, a steam pipe or, or an electrical pipe. And they have properties. This is a valve. Um, and, and these are really important because we have staff that know in their heads where these things are, but those staff are not going to be here forever um, as much as we love them. Um, they have to move, retire and, and do different things. 
And we need to know where these things are, right? And we need to be able to track them and maintain them. And if we can have a digital model that avoids people having to go into these tunnels, they're often very unsafe to be in and really should only be entered by, by professionals with proper gear. Um, but having it digitally is a safe a way for us to, to maintain these assets in a digital sense and know where things go. And it's just a really cool data set. Absolutely. If I could just add briefly, yeah, this, this project was was uh, one that uh, a lot of people were excited about in the facilities operations team because we uh, went into it saying we're going to scan uh, every valve, every shutoff valve in those tunnels. And this has multiple utilities running through these tunnels. And as Jonathan said, in some sections is unsafe. And in some sections we have, you know, maybe a small steam leak and they might be almost uninhabitable to go through. So having this information just kind of, again, changed uh, the way that we approach maintaining our campus. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you can see in the VR model there, I mean, there are dozens of pipes, lines on every surface, right? They, they're everywhere and they were modeled from, you know, foot in diameter to down to a few inches in diameter, right? So. It's an incredible data set and it will be continue to be one. Um, and relatively recently, we've, we've purchased some enterprise grade drones and been flying enterprise grade drones around our campus for facilities work, for beauty shots of some of our properties. As you can see, I'm in the office now. Um, I've been flying drones for uh, a while, I guess since about 2010. And I can tell you, these drones you see on the screen here are way easier than when, when I started this a few years back. Um, and we're getting a lot of value out of them very quickly. So we have a lot of buildings. We have a lot of old buildings that have a lot of age. And anytime you put a person on a ladder, it's not safe, right? Um, the screen here at the bottom, we know that there's leaks here, but this is on a hill under a tree. It would not be safe to send a person up there, but you know, sending a small drone up to really get photographs, to really show where all those old patches are, it's really valuable. Um, we have another aging building that we know has wood frame windows and many of them are leaking and show signs of deterioration, but uh, it would be challenging, time, time consuming in some locations to send somebody up on a lift to look at all these windows, and really actually kind of difficult for some of the other windows and some of the other walls, but we can send a drone up in a controlled and safe way following the FAA and university guidelines and practices to take a picture of every window, in this case with full color and in thermal infrared heat to show where all these deficiencies are. The top screen here, you can see a lot of the rot and splitting in this window, but if we look at the, the thermal, the black and white there, you can see there's actually a little bit more ghosting in that dark black there. That's cold, probably wet, wood that's not as obvious from the splitting in the color picture and and a lot of these windows are like that and even if it's just enough to say hey here's pictures they're all bad that's really valuable for the carpenter because it you know i could do that in a couple hours and it would have taken his staff days to to do that um uh, some of these pictures i think speak for themselves it's just having a little guy go up and take a picture real quick saves a trip to the roof which is usually always not safe um this one in the middle here with this rainbow color I see the time, um, you know, that black blue there is uh, standing water on the roof and you can kind of see it a little bit in color and the, the RGB color there, but some of those spots it's not obvious. And so that's a really quick way to say, hey, there's an issue. So I think that's what we've got. Thank you guys so much. I think we've got some time for questions there, Cassandra, right? Um, you're welcome to take a quick shot there of our QR codes. Those will just generate an email to Mark or myself if you want to learn more. Um, and we're really happy you joined us tonight. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you both. That was fabulous. And uh, if the students are anything like me <clears throat> and as you're sharing your slides and your work, I'm just thinking of all of the other applications that this could be used for. I mean, it really is endless. And I just, I wanna hear from, from those in the audience, you know, I, I know we heard from Eric asking questions, can something like this be used to map a deep lake? Um, Luna and I spoke earlier today and we were talking about climate change and how applications like this could be used for, you know, communities that need to relocate due to changing water lines or, you know, all of that information. It's, it's so powerful and then how you start building something from scratch and so I really appreciated you know the fact that you guys walked us through this project you know starting from the beginning 
and where you are now, because there's the application is endless. So I'm curious to hear what folks were thinking about how they could use this applications. And I'm also going to shout out to David. I know that David's probably thinking of how he could use it from the insurance standpoint. Uh, I know Marco probably has some ideas as well. I'm, I'm pulling on Marco because he always has some great questions. So I'm going to pause and let folks put, you know, how they're thinking this application's used. Um, but I do want to ask, uh, you know, as a student um, wanting to get involved in what's going on on campus, are there any opportunities for students to participate, um, perhaps internships or how they can get involved? Is there any opportunities? Yes, uh, I could speak to this. There are, uh, we currently have two interns uh, that are with facilities and real estate. And, and I think we're gonna have a position that's gonna be posted soon, probably in the coming weeks. Uh, but we, we try to make two interns to help us with uh, GIS data collection and just be involved with the support and, and uh, maintenance of all of the apps that we have. Yeah. Yep, that, that, that's right. I, um, we, we've brought on students that have GIS background, whether undergraduate or masters or interns that have no GIS background. They're just capable and smart and seem like good people to work with. Um, and, and train them up from scratch, you know? So our current intern, he's leaving for a full-time job. When he started, he had no GIS background. So was like, here's an iPad, you know, use field maps. You're gonna go take pictures of fire hydrants or whatever. And towards the end of it, he is able to completely capture the entire, you know, field mapping experience from identifying the data set, creating the data layers, creating the web services, making a map and doing the data collection and sending it to the, the, the customer or the client, you know, hey, uh, project manager so-and-so, here, I, I've, I've mapped all the speed bumps for you, right? So um, we have lots of work. We have lots of campuses. <laughs> you know, I indicated all that data. You know, we try to keep everything updated and touched once every couple of years. So oh, there's something always available. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I can add that one of our former interns is now working for JMT. Yes. Uh, the engineering you. firm. So all We're of our interns our have been very successful. Yes, our interns have been extremely successful in going on to do uh, serious work in, in the GIS community. Oh, that's great. Well, we did have a couple questions that came in. Um, so yeah. David said, thank you very much for sharing your wonderful presentation. Um, he's you know, thinking of like the big picture and how this could be used and applied. He's thinking more of like large public school systems or municipalities and that are under a certain budget. And, you know, thinking of aging infrastructure and the, how this could support maintenance and construction, do you guys have some sort of like equation or documentation that could help estimate, you know, for others that want to do projects like this is like, you know, here's, here's what you should be asking for budget wise for creating this project from scratch. It's kind of like a big open ended question. <laughs> Yeah, that one's tough because it really, it really depends on uh, what you have to work with, what kind of foundation you have. You know, we, we were blessed at Johns Hopkins to have a data center and there's an infrastructure kind of in place to kind of spin up, uh, you know, servers and, and, and there's a stable network. But then you really have to have a strategic plan that you put together to say, this is what we're going to tackle first. And then you really got to connect with your stakeholders to determine, you know, how is it going to how is this system going to live, breathe, and, and grow? So, you know, you can't do it in a vacuum. And I think that was the thing that we did right to start. Like we, we did like a kind of a, do a, a cast a broad net to talk to people all over the university to say, this is something we want to build. Would you participate and, you know, put your data in our hands so that we can uh, have kind of a complete system? And they said, yes. So making sure you have the right people at the table, that will kind of lay the foundation for how much you need to invest to get, get it started. And you don't have to do everything all at once. I mean, you can start with one server and, and say, we're just gonna tackle these small mm -hmm. data sets, these two or three, but then you could grow it from there. So mm -hmm. I, I really think you can size it to your budget, but I think the most important part is, is having uh, uh, a good conversation with stakeholders and, and having a, a good strategic plan. And, and I'd add to that, you know, in terms of the cost, you have to think about, this is only as good as the data that you have. Right. So if you know and you do that strategic planning and, and David and it says, hey, we need interior GIS for all of our buildings. Oh, but we've only got really, really out of date and terrible paper drawings. That's a big problem. Right. So the infrastructure, the IT, the server management, the app licensing, that's not your cost. Right. That, that's not free, um, but your big cost 
And your challenge of ROI there is the digitization and the transformation of old out of date records into something into that modern sense. So like Mark said, we, we have the blessing of a history of good data records for our buildings. Um, and, and I don't know about public education, but I think a lot of universities are under the mandate to have those records because they have to report back to the federal government how space is being used. I, I don't know if public education or, or you know municipal systems have to do that as well, but I would I would think you know if, if everybody said hey we need to do this but we don't know where the data is for that that's what's going to cost you money because that's that's labor that's human capital and that that can be expensive. So I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think also from the public school side of things, Esri is a big supporter for making sure that software is, is yes. free and accessible and many different applications are already built and put in place. So all the schools have to do is, is add their own information. So I think that's another great resource. Um, and I just want to bring an example. Um, the, the school that I helped integrate GIS, a public school, um, they had some graffiti problems. And so they built a graffiti app. And so students got to go around and take pictures of graffiti. And so that the city could come in and the students could also, they created a beautification club and they were able to be proactive and, and start cleaning up the, the, the neighborhood. So again, working really small and kind of building something is, is really great. And, the, the, you, and they have the support from Esri, which is fabulous. Yeah, just shout out to Esri. They were really supportive of, of our uh, infrastructure build out and we were closely with the library to get us the licenses. And I know all the students at, at Hopkins have access to use ArcGIS and other tools. And that's, yes. that's just great to have. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have a question from Marco, which is great because Marco always asks great questions here. Um, what relational databases do you find to be more robust when developing a GIS enterprise system? And what are the key reasons uh, when should a document-based database be used or should it when developing a GIS enterprise system? Great question. Yes, this is good. Well, there's two questions there I have interpreted. Yes. So everything we're doing is a relational database. We use SQL Server because that is a robust enterprise software managed by the university, right? And it has mature support and scaling and power. Uh, Mark, jump in here at any time, but that's uh, our, yep, that's others, our software. Microsoft right? SQL is what we've used, but I mean, of course, you can use Oracle. There's other databases. Sure, and I know <laughs> that in the enterprise GIS sense, Oracle and Postgres and many others, they're just, that seems more about your organization, correct? you know, than, than it is about your data. Um, everything I have done, so I'm a little biased, is, uh, you know, have been a relational database, and often what we do in facilities work is is very relational. Things are related to things in a, in a very traditional table sense. Um, that being said, I think, you know, document-based, you know, would, in my mind, would be, you know, anything that's event-driven, right? Anything that's a big time or happening a lot. Um, I know people feel like, well, you could kind of put any schema into a, into a document, into a JSON or something. And I've worked on projects where we started that way and they said, well, a document is better for blah. So, well, this is really relational data. Let's move it back that way. But not everything's like that, right? Um, right. I actually think you know, if we were kind of Esri based, right? So the, um, the what's the product called? Like the Geo Event Server and yes. the Spatio Temporal yeah. Big Data Store. I'm fairly certain those are document based uh, database systems. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm not 100%, but I think I'm kind of close. Uh, and, and it's really because you're processing massive amounts of real-time data very fast, right? And so you would leverage that document-based uh, information. I think Esri is building up graph database capabilities as well, right? Where the, the relationship between the entities is just as important as the entities themselves. But we're kind of traditional. Relational works very well, yeah. I think, for what we're doing. <laughs> But I think that's something you need to really study before you go into your project to say, make sure your database selection matches the outcome that you're looking for. So you really got to scope it accurately and talk to people who are professionals in the industry. So we, you know, one thing I did early on was I, I talked to the uh, Ivy Plus institutions. And then I also talked with uh, our consulting colleagues at JMT. And, and that helped to kind of narrow down what will be the best practice for what we're going to roll out. I think, uh, you know, we're very proud of the data that we've generated and built and updated and confirmed and, and, and co integrated and made relational in our systems. We're very proud of our work. But when we talk to our 
system administrators in central IT, we're 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 in the kiddie pool, you know, in terms of data that that they manage because yeah. you know that's that they're they're managing data for a much larger system within Johns Hopkins, and we're we're kind of kicking around with our waiters in terms of the amount of data that we've generated. Very good data, very valuable, but you know, a different different scale of information. Absolutely. That just means we have a lot more room to grow. We do. We do. Absolutely. Well, this was fabulous. And again, it's just, it's, I, I want to check in with you both, you know, five years from now, because I know that you, this is, it's, you're going to take it to the next level. Um, the, actually, the one question that I had when you were showing the, the pipes underneath the, the school, are you hoping to have some sort of quantitative, quantitative data set with like leaky pipes or like, you know, actual point symbols tied to that with like this valve needs to be replaced? Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the valves do have a record in the asset management system, but that is a work record. It would have its information on, hey, you know, somebody's supposed to walk by this every day and turn it and turn it, right? That's an actually, believe it or not, that's actually really important maintenance, right? To just take this giant water valve that's like this and just go whoop, whoop, once every day or so, right? Because it helps it from binding. Um, and that is very non-spatial data. It's very important to the operation of the university. It's happening all the time and you don't realize it, but we do want to link them to a physical location in the map, right? So that pipe diagram, that's all surveyed to geodetic ground control. So we know exactly where that stuff is and X, Y, Z, you know, with, with great precision. Uh, so we can say that valve is right there and it's this big and it, and it corresponds to this work in the work order management system and it's this old uh, and it was installed then. Now, again, I mean, if we don't have that data, we don't have it, but the the, the database is there to to add that stuff in, right, to, to, to put those things together. Absolutely. I think we're going to certainly get there. Um, just kind of tracking uh, repairs. Like I said, we have sometimes uh, steam tunnels down there. Sometimes there are small steam leaks and just tracking the repairs and tracking the age of those pipe segments. Mm -hmm. So you want to do preventive maintenance where you can too. So having all that information in, in the system is going to help uh, kind of guide that preventive maintenance and linking it to our work order maintenance system where we, we do asset management. So I think there's a lot of potential for growth and doing some analysis on that data uh, once we get it all um, available to everyone who needs it in the field. Well, that's great. Well, I think we're kind of at that time. Um, again, I wanna thank you both for sharing your work with us. That was fabulous. And for those attending, uh, thank you for being here tonight. I want to remind everyone that GIS After Dark is the first Thursday of every month. So we'll see you next month. And um, I will be sending out the presenter. I'll keep it as a surprise. But again, I want to thank you for joining us. And um, let's go ahead and give Jonathan and Mark another round of applause. Um, that was terrific. So th thank you, everyone. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next month. All right. So thank pleasure. you both. Thank you. Take care.